The Karsten Alberta Temple, 100th Anniversary, August 26, 1923 to August 26, 2023. Come with me on an exciting journey as we explore the beginnings, construction, and experiences of the beautiful, majestic Cardston Alberta Temple. The House of the Lord, Holiness to the Lord, our journey begins. In 1887, a group of 40 pioneers left Logan, Utah, under the direction of Brigham Young, to settle southern Alberta. Ten to fourteen years later, this developed into a thriving 3,000-plus Mormon colony. The active, faithful members, of which there were over 3,000, justified the need for a house of the Lord. By 1912, the Latter-day Saint population in Alberta had grown to approximately 7,000, and the large, remote concentration of church members drew President Smith's attention as a potential location for a temple. This was written on the bottom of the picture. It was quite possible that it was used for the submission for the temple site. In the northeast corner, showing the north and east front and the, of the site, people were there standing at, on top of the uh, ground, of uh, the knoll, as well as on the sidewalk in order to be able to see the highest point of the lot, giving a good idea of the most excellent eminence of the site for the building. And as you can see, there is quite a difference in height. This is a black and white photograph of the tabernacle. The north front showing the crown of the hill to be several feet higher than the ground the tabernacle stands on. On February 13, 1913, President Wood received a letter from Elder Orson F. Whitney telling him in confidence that it was decided to build the temple in Cardston. With the site chosen, President Smith traveled to Cardston and dedicated the site on July 27, 1913. This is a photograph of President Joseph F. Smith. He was also speaking in the tabernacle to the crowd. It was dated the 27th of July, 1913. A large number of people in, were in attendance. What a special occasion. On September 19th, 1915, David O. McKay presided over the Cornerstone Lane ceremony. A special trial was made for this purpose. On November 5, 1913, ground was broken and construction began. A contract was made with a quarry near Nelson, British Columbia to ship white granite to Cardston. Two years later, on September 19, 1915, with nearly 2,000 people gathered to watch, Elder David O. McKay helped place the, and mortar the cornerstone using the ceremonial trowel made for the occasion. This is in the visitor center in front of the Cardston Temple.
One of the challenges of building the Karsten Temple was the fact that it was in the middle of nowhere. Its isolation enhances its majesty because it is in the middle of nowhere on a mound in the city of Karsten. But it is also very difficult to bring these materials in from long distances and during the time of building the temple. There was a lot going on. As we can see, the a lot of dedicated men. Over the next two years, work progressed slowly on the temple. On September 23, 1917, the capstone was set, and efforts shifted to completing the interior of the building. Edward J. Wood coordinated construction efforts in Cardston, having already supervised the construction of the Cardston Tabernacle, which was completed in 1914. He would later serve as Karsten's first temple president while still presiding over the Alberta stake. Those challenges were enhanced because of World War I. The local supplies were depleted because of the war. They had to look at vast distances at bringing all of the granite and other building supplies in. As you can see, the men are very dedicated. The stones were huge. They had to be cut to size so that they would fit in to the spaces where they were needed. Lots of hard work. They didn't have the tools like we have today. Very, very manual. You can see the size of these stones in comparison to the men. Work to finish the interior of the temple continued from 1917 until 1923. The project culminated with the dedication of the temple on August 26, 1923. Here you can see the steel, the rebar for added strength in the flooring of the temple. In the dedicatory prayer, President Grant prayed, we thank Thee, our Father and our God, for those now living who embrace the gospel in this choice land, and others who have emigrated from the United States and other countries to Canada, and that they are now to have the privilege of entering into this holy house and laboring for the salvation of their ancestors. The block and tackle that was used to lift the blocks to the higher portions of the temple to place them put them in place you can see where the men are carving them and cutting them to be the correct size and shape The foreman was always there to make sure that everything was going according to plan and that everything was going in properly. This was the house of the Lord. Additional images of the construction of the temple. They worked in the winter time as well. They cleared off the snow and the ice so that they could continue to work on their temple. You can see in the background the land was, there was nothing there, it was just all empty with the occasional house of, of farmland. As we can see the temple is gradually taking shape. It's going to be a beautiful building. With a capstone on top. Here we can see a laborer working inside the building. 
He's very high up, as we can tell by the height of the ladder. Nineteen twenty three at the dedication we can see the cars that were used. The automobiles were the latest at the time, just as our vehicles are the current vehicles. But you can also tell that the there was no pavement, it was just a brick a uh, dirt road. With the beautiful majestic temple in the background. A lot of people had come to the dedication. As mentioned earlier, there were over 2,000 people. The first temple president was uh, President Wood. The construction of the temple sparked great interest through the ch out the church. The Relief Society General Board received letters from many women expressing a wish to donate their might toward this glorious project. The board established to establish a penny subscription modeled after one started by Mercy Fielding Thompson and Mary Fielding Smith for the Nauvoo Temple. By saving a penny each week, the women of the Relief Society were able to contribute more than three thousand thirteen thousand dollars to the construction of temples in Alberta and Ley, Hawaii. Here we have a picture of the Northwestern States Mission Caravan. We have the McGrath Temple Choir, the Raymond Temple Choir, and a group of individuals who are just excited to be at the temple open house, the temple dedication. In this particular image, we have the and not one of the automobiles at the time with a family, perhaps, and perhaps there were friends with a family in front of the temple. The ground again, as you notice, it was just dirt. The cornerstone was 1915, as you can see in the upper picture on the right, as well as the completed temple. Hearts must be pure to come within these walls, where spreads a feast unknown to festive halls. Freely partake, for freely God hath given, and taste the holy joys that tell of heaven. Here learn of him who triumphed o'er the grave, and unto men the keys the kingdom gave. Joined here by powers that past and present bind, the living and the dead perfection find. This was written specifically for the Karsten Alberta Temple by Orson F. Whitney. You'll find it in the front doors as you go into the temple. A beautiful, beautiful promise. The temple used to have gardens. These were quite beautiful, as you can see. The gardener is in the on the right. What a privilege it would have been to look after the grounds. A lot of beautiful trees and shrubbery and plants that he would have. This is taken from the inside of the visitor center. A depiction of the Savior Jesus Christ showing the spirits um, that have not come to the earth as yet. Those that have already passed through the veil those whose genealogy is being done and the work gotten ready so that their work can be done so they can be sealed as families for eternity. What a beautiful portrait of the plan of salvation. This too is in the visitor center. A beautiful picture of the Karsten Temple in winter. And in spring, 
you'll see that the this is on the outside of the temple. Beautiful, beautiful picture. We have the we see the gates and the steps going up into the temple. Here we have an image of the temple in the bottom right corner with the tabernacle in the upper right corner. You'll also notice that there was not much building around the temple. There were some homes, but is is mostly scattered. We see the temple again with the with an individual on horseback that is enjoying being in the presence of the temple. Here we have an image of the tabernacle to the left of the temple. The Karsten Temple was renovated throughout the 1950s. Ground at the base of the temple was excavated and roofed over, increasing the size of the building to make room for offices and locker areas. Because stone from the original quarry in British Columbia was not available for the addition, stone was manufactured in Salt Lake City, Utah to match that of the original structure. During this time, there was a general feeling that all old things needed a refreshing, leading to older color schemes being replaced. Many of the original features were covered and others were removed. Elements affected by the changes included flooring, lighting, wall coverings, woodwork, and other details of the interior design. The upper garden of the temple was removed and replaced with glass and steel structure that served as a reception area. This was a Christmas card that was given to the temple workers by the First Presidency. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 and 15. Another beautiful picture of the temple. For generations, the famous Old Chief Mountain guided the Native American tribesmen in their wanderings up and down the Great North Trail. Later, it became a guidepost for the stream of immigrants from the south to their new homeland in Canada. You can see the elements taking their toll on the woman at the well the, that had been created for the temple, as well as on the exterior of the temple. Here we have Old Chief. You'll notice that in a lot of paintings and pictures of the temple, Old Chief is very prominent. There's a prophecy that someday Old Chief will crumble and it will no longer be there. And so I believe that is why we have so many pictures of Old Chief with the temple, Karsten Temple. Torlief Nafis, a well-known LDS sculptor, created a most impressive frieze of cast concrete, which is now located in the main entryway of the temple. The subject, about 20 feet wide by 8 feet high, is that of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. It depicts the Savior in the attitude of telling the woman that he would give her of the living water. Here we have a picture of the first company of workers and the other pictures with the additional people are the people that have come to the temple and they were excited to be there and we have their pictures and they're happy to have their pictures taken to be part of this historic moment. And this was at the dedication August 26, 1923, Heber, President Heber J. Grant did the dedication.
And this is the same picture that has been colorized. It's a beautiful, glorious day. What a majestic building our beautiful Carson Alberta Temple is. When it was first constructed and the beginnings of the temple, you can t see that there was not very much around. It was a lot of farmland, uh, some houses, and we see the temple and the tabernacle in the upper left corner with the town in the upper right portion of the picture, but the majority of it was farmland. And we can see this is another aspect of the farmland looking out towards the temple. Again, the temple and the tabernacle was just basically almost by itself with nothing around it except for a few buildings. Here we have the tabernacle and the temple. This was an aerial view of the temple. The year is unknown. Between 1988 and 1991, the temple was closed for more renovation and restoration. Numerous upgrades were made to the temple's electrical and mechanical systems. But after the work necessitated uncovering the temple's original murals, the project's primary focus shifted to restoring the temple to its 1923 splendor. Many of the elements previously covered or removed were restored or recreated. A single-story addition of reinforced concrete was built at the entrance of the temple to accommodate visitors and wedding parties. The glass and steel reception structure was removed and replaced with a reception area that complemented the original design. A new garden area was built that was sympathetic to the original garden designed by Burton and Pope, though it did not replicate it. And you can see that as you go in through the temple gates to the front of the entrance of the temple. It's quite beautiful. This was taken by George E. Anderson between 1923 and 1925. Again, another picture of the Karsten Temple in the wintertime. Quite beautiful. Here we can see the business section of Karsten and Lee's Creek. There was not very much there. The roads were dirt. It has come a long way since then. In 1991, at the dedication, the total attendance of the open house was 101,519. You can see from the image on the right of Main Street that it has come a long ways in the progress. We have pavement now and more modern buildings. Again, this is an image of the reinforced floor of the temple. Again, the year is unknown. This was taken November 10th, 2005 at quarter after seven in the morning. What a beautiful picture. This is another picture taken by George E. Anderson between 1923 and 1925 of the Samaritan and J Jesus at the well. And again, another image of the caretaker, the landscaper for the 
garden temple grounds was James Albert Layton. He is standing in the middle of the picture, holding the hose in the center. In 1927, we can see that there was a lot of trees and shrubbery. The temple and the tabernacle are very prominent. Some additional beautiful pictures of the sky with the temple. We have Old Chief in the background. Additional pictures with the different sky. It was 10 years that the Latter-day Saints were laboring on the temple. And these are a few of the tools that they used as they were working on this beautiful sacred building. The wedge was used to finish splitting apart rocks. The small hammer was a finishing hammer that was used to more precisely shape the rock in the desired size and shape needed. If you remember from earliest images in the temp that we had in the presentation, the huge blocks of granite that were brought in, they had to be shaped to the precise measurements that were required for them to fit properly into as they were building the structure. The rock drill was used for drilling holes in rock. A large sledge was used to pound one end of the drill and then turn it once and pound it again and continue until hole, the hole was deep enough to place dynamite in it. This would be in comparison to the modern day jackhammer. Aren't you glad that you weren't back then using the jackhammer? It was quite primitive. The work on the construction that the early settlers did was very time-consuming and very labor-intensive. A lot of dedication and love went into the work that the early members did. The reamer, you would set the end of this tool with a large hammer, then turn the tool and hit it again to make the drilled hole larger. The grub hole was used for picking and digging in the ground that has rock in it. We have a similar one today. We have the uh, crowbar, but it has a pointed end, which makes it much easier when you put it in the ground. You can move it around and uh, make the hole bigger, and it would be much easier. This one just had flat ends on each side. The ceremonial trowel that we looked at earlier that David O. McKay used when he laid the cornerstone was specifically designed for the purpose of laying the, this capstone and the cornerstone. President David O. McKay later became the president of the church and he served from 1951 to 1970. And these two are in the visitor center. Hiram Pope was the architect of the Lay Temple, the Karsten Temple, the Mesa Temple, and the state capitol in Utah. The First Presidency passed over the traditional schemes to choose a daringly modern design. When the winning entry was announced on the 1st of January 1913, it was learned that the winners were Hiram Pope and Harold Burton, two young architects who had been in business less than three years. Pope, the engineer and business manager of the firm, was a capable and ambitious German immigrant of 32. Burton, 
the junior partner and designer was only 25 years old. This commission launched their prolific and creative careers, which were to include such other distinguished buildings as the Hawaii Temple, the Montepelier and Blackfoot Tabernacles in Idaho, the Wilshire Ward in Los Angeles, the Honolulu Tabernacle, and the Oakland Temple. In style, the winning design for the temple showed some similarities to the work of the great modern American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. Working in Chicago, Wright had designed residences and public buildings that were bold in form, original in their geometric and decorative details, and carefully blended with their natural surroundings. Pope and Burton were among Wright's earliest admirers in the western United States. There was also a vague resemblance to the temple in the pre-Columbian ruins of Mexico and Central America, which Burton greatly admired. Combining these influences, the temple design was unquestionably in the forefront of American architecture of the period. A temple of the Lord should not be a large Gothic cathedral, but rather the structure should be simple yet majestic to match the message of the restored gospel. From Hiram Pope And as we can see, the temple is majestic and it does match the message of the restored gospel. The Karsten Alberta Temple is the sixth dedicated temple in operation. The temple was announced on June 27, 1913, and was built on an eight-acre plot given to the church by Charles Oricard. The site expanded to more than 10 acres in the mid-1950s. The site was dedicated by Joseph F. Smith on June 1, 1915. Located in Karsten, Alberta, it is the oldest LDS temple outside of the United States. Here we can see the detailed geographic geometric carvings around the tops of the windows. It is quite beautiful and very, very detailed. It is one of nine temples that do not have an angel Moroni statue, and one of three without spires, similar to Solomon's temple. The other two are the Lei Temple, Hawaii Temple, and the Mesa, Arizona Temple. The construction of the Karsten Alberta Temple took approximately 10 years, partially due to World War I. Upon completion, visitors were given the opportunity to tour the temple. During the construction, builders ran out of wood, a scarce commodity on the islands. The members were able to procure the needed lumber when a ship ran aground and needed to unload some of its cargo of wood. The temple workers volunteered to help and were given the wood and lumber out of gratitude. The lumber taken from the ship proved to be just enough to finish the temple. There are no coincidences. This was the Lord's house, and he provided what was needed. Originally dedicated on August 26, 1923, by President Heber J. Grant, an addition was rededicated on July 2, 1962, by Hubie Brown. The temple was renovated and updated in the 1990s, and Gordon B. Hinckley rededicated it on June 22, 1991. In 1992, the temple was declared a National Historic Site, and a plaque was dedicated in 1995. Latter-day Saints, led by Charles Oricard, arrived at Lee's Creek, which later became known as Cardston, Alberta, in the late spring of 1887. Within days, the band of pioneers began to hold their first religious services. At first, these gatherings were held out of doors, in tents, or under a small bowery. Amid the press of establishing the settlement, planting crops, and building log homes, 
Card and others also set their sights on building a more permanent place for community education, entertainment, and worship. By late January 1888, a 20-foot square log meeting house had been completed to suit the purpose, but the population of Cardston quickly grew and outgrew this modest structure, and in 1893 it was replaced by a larger frame building. The Assembly Hall, as it was known, outlasted its predecessor by only six years. By 1904, with the arrival of the railroad in Cardston, there was need for a larger place of worship to serve the needs of the rapidly growing number of Latter-day Saints in the region. You can tell and see by the, the building that it was quite elegant. The arches, the craftsmanship, it was very original. There was nothing like it. This was the tabernacle. It was dedicated May 18th, 1912. What a beautiful building. In 2006, the Karsten Company of the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, with the blessing of President Gordon B. Hinckley, placed a marker commemorating the tabernacle. Located at the northeast corner of the temple block, the marker overlooks a grassy lawn that now covers the footings of the temple. The Karsten Alberta Temple is the eighth constructed and sixth operating temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Alberta Stake Tabernacle, built on the northeast quadrant of the Cardston Temple Block, then known as Tabernacle Hill, was one of the most beautiful buildings in southern Alberta. Built by the leaders of the Alberta Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was the first stake organized outside the United States and the first stake in Canada, the tabernacle served not only as a meeting place but as a monument to the sacrifices of the early settlers. When Edward James Wood became the Alberta Stake President, he realized that the assembly hall was inadequate in size. He designed the tabernacle with seating for 1,200, including a gallery, curved oak benches, and an elevated pulpit. Behind the pulpit was space for an orchestra and seating for the stake officers. Rising up behind the orchestra were rows of seats for the choir. The organ at the very top provided music for the meetings. Church members began raising funds for the building at great personal sacrifice, and the tabernacle was finished four years later in 1912. It served primarily as a meeting house for large LDS church conferences, but was also used for educational and cultural events, and was made available to other denominations. Hiram M. Smith dedicated the building on August 5, 1917. Many Latter-day Saint General Authorities attended conferences in the Tabernacle, including Joseph F. Smith, President of the Church. The Alberta Stake Tabernacle, built on the northeast quadrant of the Karsten Temple Block, was known as Tabernacle Hill. It was one of the most beautiful buildings in southern Alberta. Built by the leaders of the Alberta Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was the first stake organized outside of the United States and the first stake in Canada, the tabernacle served not only as a meeting place but as a monument to the sacrifices of the early settlers. The cornerstone was laid August 23, 1908, with David O. McKay officiating. This red brick building replaced an old assembly hall that had been built under the direction of Stake President Charles Ora Card to serve as a combined community hall and meeting place. The Alberta Stake Tabernacle served the people of Southern Alberta for 42 years until a new stake center was built west of the temple block. The structure was dismantled in 1954. Steel gates mirror the geometric motives and the shape of the temple itself. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful gate. Jesus and the woman at the well, a bas relief by Torlief Nafis, is cast in concrete, carefully matched to the granite. Originally, a pool reflected it. Here we have images of the different rooms in the temple, and these are all by uh, copyright from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have the creation room, the garden room, the terrestrial room, and the world room. Oak with inlay is in the creation room. Bird's eye maple is in the garden room. Southern South Maple Walnut is in the world room, African Mahogany in the terrestrial room, and again, as I mentioned, it, this is copyright by the Corporation of the President, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have a few images that these are all copyright by the Corporation of the President, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Celestial Room Wainscot is Utah onyx on a marble base. The African mahogany panels feature exquisite inlays of rosewood, maple, ebony, and tulip woods. The couch, originally upholstered in dark red, and the table were designed by the architect to match the temple's style. Each leaded window contains 144 small panes in geometric designs and each wall is set off by the decorative grillwork over its arch. The ceiling rooms are richly paneled, this one in cross-grained mahogany triangles forming two-foot squares. The chairs were designed for this room. The Norwegian-born sculptor Tarliev Nafis carved the cast concrete oxen to support the tile-lined concrete font. Its ornamentation recalls the triangular carvings on the outside of the building. The mural, Adam Offering Sacrifice, is by A.B. Wright. We have two famous paintings in the temple by the Norwegian-born sculptor Torliev Nafis, The Woman at the Well, and the Baptismal Font. Natural light brightens the clear tones of the garden room. Details on the bench legs match the altar. The benches were assembled and stained in the room itself so that they would match the bird's eye paneling. This garden room triptych by Lee Green Richards uses impressionist techniques in its blue and purple shadows. His treatment of the foliage and peacocks were popular elements of an art Nauvoo, a turn of the century movement. Detail from A.B. Wright's Baptism of Christ, one of four murals in the baptistry. In the subcreation room, Leconte Stewart shows the earth swimming into focus in a series of paintings that become progressively less abstract and more defined, representative of the creative periods themselves. A jaguar snarls above the dead impella in the world room. Edwin Evans and his assistant, Florence Christensen, used local scenes in their paintings for added impact. The temple was announced the 27th of June, 1913. It was, the site was dedicated the 27th of July, 1913 by Joseph F. Smith. 
The groundbreaking occurred the 9th of November, 1913, by Daniel Kent Green. The public open house had tours that were offered during the final years of construction from 1920 to 1923. The dedication of from the 26th to the 29th of August, 1923, was by President Heber J. J. Grant. It was rededicated on the 2nd of July, 1962, by Hubie Brown for the edition only. The public open house was from the 6th to the 15th of June, 1991, and a rededication from the 22nd to the 24th of June, 1991, by Gordon B. Hinckley. Due to an increase in temple attendance, it was necessary to increase the size of the temple a second time. A 3,500 square foot addition on the east side of the building was approved in 1964 and included an assembly room, library, and additional facilities for those who would perform baptisms for the dead. This work was completed in 1966. The site was 10 acres. We have the capstone lane on the 23rd of September, 1917. A lot of people were up at the top wanting to be a participant in the, that wonderful experience. White granite quarried from a site near the Kootenai Lakes in Nelson, British Columbia was the exterior finish. Every stone was hand hewn. Additions have been made of precast granite. There are four ordinance rooms, four stage progressive, and five ceiling rooms. The total floor area is 88,562 square feet. The Karsten Alberta Temple is a historic Alberta landmark that stands on elevated ground in the center of Karsten. Founded by settlers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1887, the small community lies just 15 miles north of the U.S.-Canada border on southern Alberta's fertile plains. Outside the gates of the temple, a public visitor center, which is operated in the summer, offers several displays including construction photographs dating to the early 1900s. Beautiful temple. This is when the capstone was laid in 1917, the 23rd of September. The weather was rather inclement, as you can tell, with the umbrellas and the overcoats of the men. Here we have um, an image of the dedication of the temple in August the 26th, 1923, by President Heber J. Grant. Another image of the dedication, August 26, 1923. We see the vehicles that were there, that were used, uh, with the ground was just dirt with a beautiful majestic building. The chimney that you see in to the right is from the tabernacle. Here we see the temple and the tabernacle in the upper right corner with a lot of farmland. On July 26, 1905, we can see the Cardston Main Street and the buildings at the time. This is some more farmland, and you can see the irrigation ditch beside. The 
Protestant Alberta Tabernacle and Temple. In 2006, the Carson Company of the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, with the blessing of President Gordon B. Hinckley, placed a marker commemorating the tabernacle. It's located in the northeast corner of the temple block, and the marker overlooks a grassy lawn that now covers the footings of the tabernacle. In 1927, again, we see lots of trees and shrubbery. We see the temple and the tabernacle. This was the hailstorm, the 27th of July, 2012. The temple is a refuge in the storms of life. We can always attend the temple and we feel the, the peace that we that uh, passeth all understanding. This was a horrendous storm. There was a lot of damage. It looked like a war zone at the conclusion of the storm. The temple was safe, a safe haven. Contributors were uh, from these images were to the University of Lethbridge Library, Ro Beth A. Rosenval, and the Jim and Mary Curl Public Library in Cardston. You can see the tabernacle and the temple. It was dedicated on the 18th of May, 1912. This was the tabernacle. What a beautiful building. far ahead of its time for that time period. One of the people that went through the temple dedication, um, prior to the dedication when the open house, had written a letter and uh, President uh, Wood had sent this to Brother Smith. He said, I am pleased to answer your letter of December 1st. First, as to the letter of a non-member who wrote of impressions received while going through the temple before it was dedicated, the truth of which letter you asked me to verify and which I am pleased to do. It was a Quaker lady who was a magazine writer from Eastern Canada. She has some relatives in Lethbridge, about 60 miles from Cardston, and being so deeply impressed on her first visit, she had them bring her a second time. This time I was acting as a guide. She would sit in each room and never said a word to any in the company, but seemed to be in deep meditation all the time. When she reached her own home several weeks after, she wrote this letter which has caused so much comment all over the church. We have never been able to understand how she seemed to know so much about our faith and our belief in our future life and works after death. I never learned her real name. She visited us along in 1921. I have never heard from her since that time, but the letter is genuine and of her own impressions received while in the temple while on the two visits she mentions. Again, this was from uh, President Wood, Elder Wood, uh, the president of the Alberta Stake. And this is the letter that this individual wrote. We have been to the temple erected by your church, wherein are to be performed the sacred rites in ordinance, in accordance with your faith. The first time I was strongly impelled to describe to you my impressions. I did so, but after the completion of the letter, I received some news that so affected me that acting upon the spur of the moment, I destroyed the letter, the document in its entirety. The continued feeling within me of dissatisfaction as to something left undone, coupled with a desire upon the part of the members of my household who had not visited the temple, led to our second visit to Cardston, in which you so kindly consented to accompany us. Notwithstanding the inclement weather and personal inconvenience to yourself, which the journey entailed. 
It was because of this and many other evidences of your friendship that has given me the privilege to presume to bother you with what, after all, may be foolish fantasies of a too impressionable mentality. To me it does seem so, for never before in my life have such powerful impressions been infringed upon my inner consciousness as during my visit through the temple. Especially was this true at our second visit. The impressions of our first visit were repeated with such overwhelming intensity and variety of detail that I must positively inform you of my experience. It seems to me it were a sacred duty upon my part to do this, and knowing as I do that your friends will lightly ridicule what to me is a personal matter, I am going to give you in detail my experience in the hope that if it is well, maybe it is something more than imagination, that you and others of your faith may wisely analyze and to correctly use wherever you may be gleaned from this letter. A fortress in time of storm was the first thought that shaped itself in my mind with my first view of this ancient yet modern temple, mellowed with the spiritual usage of ancient civilization and customs, get alert, virile, and watchful. A grand, solemn, strong, beautiful, useful house of spiritual progression, which seemed to be the embodiment of architectural expression of ancient civilization, and glories suddenly reincarnated and for a future and higher civilization than our own. Strength and beauty exaggerated the more flimsy houses and buildings of the town and gave a painfully obvious example of how this soul within is expressed through the material body, either in the individual or nation, or a race either in the man or his architecture. Try how I would, I could not get away from the feeling that the town itself was inferior to the latest building, so new and yet so old. Even the electric lights failed to change this thought, that the temple and the town represented two different epochs of humanity's spiritual commerce and development expressed in architecture. The town embodied the present epoch, science, art, invention harnessed purely for trade and commerce, irrespective of past or future development. The temple embodies the accumulated knowledge of the ancient world combined with the modern inventions of science and inspiration as the road to a higher future development so near at hand. Let me put it down even another way. There is a place called Cardston. A temple linking the past with the present has been built at Cardston, and the town has become a collection of flimsy huts nestling at the foot of the temple, which will continue to function for the spiritual purposes for which it is raised. Just as the exterior impressions compared with the present and future epochs, so did the interior also reflect comparison. Of the beautiful and artistic effects, I need not dwell. Abler pens can describe that interior from this viewpoint. Sufficient for me to say that the shape of the temple is a cross, that each apartment is a symbolical in artistic and structural effects of some stage of humanity's progress through the ages. In fact, everything physical is a stepping stone to spiritual progress as such is typified in these ceremonies. All this was kindly and intelligently explained to us by Mr. Deuce on one occasion and by Mr. Wood on the second visit, but I am afraid I was very indifferent and inattentive upon both occasions, for which I tender them my sincere apologies. I had no intentions of being rude or discourteous, but from the moment of entering the temple until leaving, I was placed in the position of having, as it were, to listen to and to grasp a dual narrative all the time, with the result that so engrossed was I at times that I am afraid I was so absent-minded as to appear inattentive, if not positively stupid. I have stated that my impression of the exterior of the building was that of a place of waiting for a higher civilization than our present one. This would suggest a condition of emptiness, but that is not what I mean. An ordinary 
newly erected building has no atmosphere at all until it has been inhabited some time, after which it has, as it were, a living atmosphere. What kind of an atmosphere that is, is largely determined by the spiritual development and thought of the persons using and inhabiting the building. This applies especially to places of worship or consecration and is very noticeable to a sensitive person. Sometimes such an atmosphere is agreeable, exalting, etc. Sometimes very much the reverse. Depending on the, upon the spiritual harmony or otherwise of the persons under this atmospheric rule, but was not so far as it was concerned while outside the temple. I could not understand the overwhelming scene of ancient atmosphere which the building actually possessed in its very granite blocks, in spite of the fact that I know a few months previous these blocks had been laid, yet the feeling of age predominated. I dismissed the feeling as well as I could by thinking that the place of the structure was responsible for the suggestion of age. But when I entered the temple, how quickly I found that there was nothing to suggest to me that present atmosphere of which I have spoken. But was it empty? Emphatically, no. Time and again, as I listened to the speaker explaining some phase of the building or its meaning, I would be seeing beyond him some illustration of kaleidoscopic nature, depicting what he was ascribing, only more completely and vividly. The characters were so plain to me that I required all my self-control to keep silent from room to room. This continued and only ceased when we were out in the first row of the frost and snow once more. There was no set plan for presenting these pictures to me. It seemed as if when I thought something mental, a picture instantly presented itself in explanation of some word or of the conductor, which would have the same effect. I was not afraid, only awed by the wonder of it all, and the fearful impressive feeling that I received, which seemed to embed every little detailed scene into my brain, from which it will ever remember and record, and vivid as all of it was, these incidents herein related are the ones upon which I received instructions. The scenes which I observed of an historical character seemed chiefly to verify and amplify the speaker's outline of past history, and so I do not feel impressed to record such, except to state that the same patriarchal characters whom I observed directing and influencing the early movements of the Church were the same down through the every age of the epoch, and as the scenes advanced to more modern times, I saw among these spiritual characters and counselors persons whose features I had previously observed as being in the material body on other historical occasions. It seemed as though the temple was filled with the actual spiritual bodies of these previous leaders of your church, each seeming to have the work that person was engaged in whilst in the flesh. In that temple I saw persons who were leaders of your church doing its march across the American desert, now engaged in helping these higher patriarchs under whose orders they seemed to be working. It was these latter spiritual leaders, if I may use that term, who seemed to be instructed to show me the scenes here recorded. I can give no time as to the be happening except that the impressions I received were of actual present or immediate future. I saw first a brief but comprehensive sketch of the present state of the world, or as you would term it, the Gentile kingdoms. Each country in turn was shown, its anarchy, hunger, ambitions, distrust, and warlike captivities, etc., and in my mind was formed some source the words as it is today with the Gentiles. I saw international war begin again to break out with its center upon the Pacific Ocean, but sweeping and encircling the whole globe. I saw that the opposing forces were roughly divided by so-called Christianity on the one side and by the so-called followers of Muhammad and Buddha on the other. I saw that the great driving power within these so-called Christian nations was the great apostasy of Rome 
in all its political, social, and religious aspects. I saw the worldwide dislocation and devastation of production and slaughter of people occur more swiftly and upon a larger scale than ever before. I saw an antagonism begin to express itself from these so-called Christian nations against your people. I saw those with a similar faith to yours in the Far East begin to look toward Palestine for safety. I saw the international world war automatically break down and nation revolution occur in every country and complete the work of chaos and desolation. I saw geological disturbances occur, which helped in this work as if it were intended to do so. I saw the Karsten Temple preserved from all of this geological upheaval. I saw the international boundary line disappear as these two governments broke up and dissolved into chaos. I saw race rioting upon the American continent on a vast scale. I saw hunger and starvation in this world. I saw disease produced by hunger, strife, and chaos complete the end of this present order or epoch. How long these events were in reaching this consummation, I do not know. But my impression was from the outbreak of the international war, these things developed into continuous procession and almost ran concurrently. As it is with a sickness, the various symptoms are all in evidence at one and the same time, but in different stages of development. My intensified thought was, what of the church, if such is to become of the kingdoms of the earth? was immediately answered by a subconscious statement, as it is in the church today. And I saw these higher spiritual beings throughout the length and breadth of the air, marshalling their spiritual forces and concentrating them upon the high officials of your church upon earth. I saw the spiritual forces working upon those officers, impressing and moving them, influencing and warning them. I saw the spiritual forces being begin to unfold these things into the minds of your elders and other high officials, especially during their spiritual devotions and official duties and those activities which exalt the mind of the individual or groups. I saw the impressions take hold up and inspire the more receptive and spiritual men, and it was all clearly revealed to them in the way the spiritual patriarch desired. Again I seemed to hear the words, as it will be. I saw the high officials in council, and under inspired guidance issue instructions to your people to reconsecrate their lives and energies to their faith, to voluntarily discipline themselves by abstaining from all those forms of indulgence which weaken the body, sap the mentality, and deaden the spirit, or waste the income. I saw further on instructions given whereby places of refuge were prepared quietly but efficiently by inspired elders. I saw Karsten in the surrounding foothills, especially north and west, for miles, being prepared as a refuge for your people, quietly but quickly. I saw elders still under divine guidance, counseling and encouraging the planting of every available acre of soil in this district so that large supplies would be near the refuge. I saw the church property under civil cultivation of an intensified character, not for sale or profit, but for the use of the people. I saw artisan wells and other wells dug all over the territory, so that when the open waters were polluted and poisoned, that the people of the church and their cattle would, should be provided for. I saw the fuel resources of the district develop in many places in vast piles of coal and timber stored for future use and building. I saw the territory carefully surveyed and mapped out for the camping of a great body of the people of the church. I saw provision also make for a big influx of people who will not at first belong to the church, but who will gather in their tribulation. I saw vast quantities of surgical appliances, medicines, disinfectants, etc., stored in the temple basement. I saw inspiration given the elders whereby the quantity, quality, and kind of things to be stored were judged, which might not be attainable in this territory in times of chaos. 
I saw defensive preparations working out the organizations of the camps on maps. I saw the mining corridors used as places of storage underground. I saw the hills surveyed in corrals built in sequestered places for cattle, sheep, etc., quietly and quickly. I saw the plans for the organization of the single men and their duties, the scouts, the guards, the nurses, the cooks, the messengers, the messengers, the children, the herders, the temple guards, etc. I saw these things going on practically unknown to the Gentile world, except the great apostasy whose knowledge and hatred is far-reaching in this day of its temporary power. This was going on piece by piece as the elders were instructed to do so. I saw the other officials obeying the inspired instructions, carrying their message and exhorting the people to carry out from time to time the revelation given them, whilst all around throughout the Gentile world the chaos developed in its varying stages, faction against faction, nation against nation, but all in open or secret hostility to your people and their faith. I saw your people grow closer and closer together as this became more tense and as the spiritual forces warned them through the mouth of your elders and your other officers. I saw the spiritual forces influencing those members who had drifted away to re-enter the fold. I saw greater tithing than ever before. I saw vast quantities of necessities supplied by members whose spiritual eyes had been opened. I saw liquidation of properties and effects disposed of quietly but quickly by members of the church as the spiritual influences directed them. I saw the inspired call sent forth to all the church to gather to the refuges of Zion. I saw the stream of your people quietly moving in the direction of their refuge. I saw your people moving more quickly and in larger numbers until all the stragglers were housed. I saw the wireless message flashed from Zion's refuge to Zion's refuge in their several places that all was well with them. And then the darkness of chaos closed around the boundaries of your people and the last days of tribulation begun. And this was written by Sauls Cardisto, the non-member, when she went through the Karsten Temple open house. This is an image of uh, Mormon settlers in Karsten in 1902. September 27th, 2013, beautiful picture of our temple, the Carson Alberta Temple. The temple was open for 24 hours in observance of the sesquicentennial of the church and the 75th birthday of the province of Alberta. 19 live sessions were performed with 2,291 endowments. There were also baptisms for the dead, ceilings, and weddings that were performed. What an exciting time that would have been to be a participant in all of that. Based on the evidence of the First Presidency in the Council of the Twelve, the Historian's Office has recorded the dedication of the Alberta Temple State Tabernacle as the 5th of August, 1917. This was aerial photograph was taken in the fall of 2003. Arts must be pure to come within these walls where spreads a feast unknown to festive halls. Freely partake, for freely God hath given, and taste the holy joys to tell of heaven. Here learn of him who triumphed o'er the grave, and unto men the keys the kingdom gave. Joined here by powers that past and present bind, the living and the dead perfection find. Again, we can see the. this is a bigger image of the 
temple and the tabernacle in the lower right corner. The Karsten is beginning to be settled, but it's still fairly open. A lot of farmland. And the uh, dwellings. On the 15th of October, 1982, Brother Paul Vance of Calgary, Alberta, brought a beautiful crystal crystal vase, green crystal vase, to the temple, saying it was an anonymous gift. It sits in the celestial room and is seen and admired by hundreds of patrons. The overlay is 24 karat gold. The value has not been estimated. Brother Vance wrote the following account of the circumstances behind the gift. Some time ago, I was assigned as home teacher to a man who was experiencing serious family difficulties. He had been very successful in the boom days of Calgary and wanted for nothing in the material things of life. His children were introduced to the church. They joined, and he and his wife joined. In the following years, the family experienced many changes. He had some real difficulties in trying to be teachable. In other words, he was a hard-working, strong-headed man. Stubborn is a better word to describe his nature. He struggled to overcome it. Many, including his family, loved him but could not endear him. As an example, he once told the bishop, You can't disfellowship me. When the bishop asked why not, he replied, Because I haven't been fellowshipped yet. As the tra crash came, he lost his thriving business, his nice home, his trips abroad, etc. One, on my first visit to him, I was told by him that he was now not a worthy member of the church. His wife had left him because of his treatment of her, and the creditors were taking everything of value that he owned. He felt that he was a finished man. He had one request. His most priceless possession, in the material sense, was a vase he had purchased in Europe. He explained to me how the vase was made, how it had to be heated several times, and how the gold inlays had to be put on while the vase was still at a high temperature, but not too high. There was much more involved in the making of the vase that I do not recall in detail. He would not specify exactly how much it cost him, but it was well over a thousand dollars, perhaps much more. He loved its beauty and appreciated, probably because of his own trade skills, the workmanship of it. He explained that they could not they could take everything he had, but there was one item that they would not get. It was the vase. He said, it belongs in the temple. I will never be worthy to go. I will never make it, were his words. But this vase belongs there. He said he wanted me to keep his name confidential. He was in bad health. He felt weak and unworthy, but he loved the Lord and said, The Lord can do anything. He can love me and forgive me. I don't care about anything else. Our goal as home teachers was to see him come to the temple and see that vase with his family. Well, things don't happen overnight, and some things that should just don't happen. His present situation in January 1984 is as follows. Financially, he is in difficulty, but he is looking ahead in a different direction, and his condition could improve. His wife visits the family on occasion, and his family is split. Half are active and half are not. But the temp green temple, the green vase is in the temple in the celestial room. President Joseph Fielding Smith, I greet you at this Christmas season in love and fellowship and with a prayer that our eternal Father will look down upon you in mercy and pour out his bounteous blessings upon you in these times when iniquity abounds, when there are great tribulations on the earth, when there are wars and rumors of wars, we are all in need, as never before, of the guiding and preserving care of the Lord. We need to know that in spite of all the troubles and ills which befall us, 
still the Lord is governing all the affairs of the earth, and that if we keep his commandments and are true and faithful to his laws, he will bless us here and now and reward us with eternal life in his kingdom in due course. I now pray that in this, this Christmas season and at all times we may center our faith in the Son of God and gain for ourselves that peace which passeth all understanding. Arts must be pure to come within these walls, where spreads a feast unknown to festive halls. Freely partake, for freely God hath given, and taste the holy joys that tell of heaven. Here learn of him who triumphs o'er the grave, and unto men the keys the kingdom gave. Join here by powers that past and present bind, the living and the dead perfection find. This was taken after a rainstorm. The temple is reflected in the water that was on the road. A beautiful, beautiful picture. Hope's and Burton's great achievement was their ability to use the newest and best design ideas in a way that was particularly appropriate for Latter-day Saint Temple. Since the new temple was to have neither a large assembly room nor towers like previous temples, a completely new arrangement had to be worked out. Burton had a difficult and frustrating time with this part of the design until a very simple and logical floor plan occurred to him as he envisioned it. And then the four ordinance rooms would be arranged around the center of the building like the spokes of a wheel each room facing one of the cardinal directions. Carson Temple is indeed a grand, beautiful, majestic building a house of the Lord. We can see how the town of Karsten has grown. The iron grates, gates with the intricate work and decorative work captivate and complement the temple. A beautiful, beautiful temple. His majesty and glory. From 1923 to 2023, we can see the growth of Karsten with our beautiful temple. North, south, east and west. It beckons all to come.
Come to the house of the Lord. Come one, come all. Beautiful place to live. Beside the holy temple. All these homes nestled at the foot of the temple. I hope you've enjoyed your journey with me as we traveled from the beginnings of the Karsten Alberta Temple to today, as we traveled through a hundred years of time. I have enjoyed presenting this to you. The temple beckons all to come within its walls.